the title of uh, my uh, talk today is Recovering Gandhi. Over the decades, there is no dearth of names that Gandhiji has been called or lack of variety in the abuse hurled at him. B.R. Nanda wrote Gandhi and his critics in the 1980s and might have thought that he had silenced them all. There is also no dearth of those who want to claim lineage without any evidence of familial affinity. Witness the founding of the BJP as a Gandhian socialist party in 1980. He has therefore to be recovered from those who would demonize him and those who would trivialize him and even distort him while trying to appropriate him. Beginning almost a century ago, imperialist ideologues had painted him as a crafty banya, a, a manipulative politician, the linchpin of a network of subcontractors like Patel, Sadat Patel, Rajendra Prasad and Jawaharlal Nehru, who helped him wrest power from the old guard of Congress politicians in 1920. He was also called a Bolshevik, a half-naked fakir. The list is endless. Marxist theoreticians such as Rajni Pamdat declared him to be the mascot of the bourgeoisie, who played a dual role in that he mobilized people into mass movements only to stop them in their tracks when they were on the brink of becoming revolutionary and threatening the interests of the propertied classes. Witness Chauri Chora in 1922, the Gandhi Urban Pact in 1931, and the negotiated compromise of the transfer of power in 1947. Three decades ago, scholars writing under the banner of subaltern studies added their own ingredients to this already heady mix. Concluding, by concluding that he did not have anything to do with the first part of the story either, that is launching and building up of the mass movements. His appeal was only to the elites, they said. The subalterns or the people got into action on their own, responding to economic crises or responding to autonomous, violent traditions of resistance. Even when it appeared that they were answering to his call, it was in fact rumors about him and not the real Gandhi to which they responded. This was Shahid Amin's contribution to the debate. In this version, popular violence of any kind, as in the Rawlat Satyagraha or at Chauri Chora or in the Quit India movement, becomes proof of this autonomous, non-Gandhian political stream. Bipin Chandra's answer, in fact, took the form of evolving an alternative framework to understand Gandhi and the Indian National Movement. Moving away from characterizing the Indian National Movement as a bourgeois movement and Gandhi as a bourgeois leader, he termed it a multi-class movement with an open-ended ideological character. He also saw Gandhi's own ideological framework as open-ended and evolving. He also gave a completely new meaning to the issue of nonviolence by seeing it as a necessary part of the strategy of struggle of the Indian national movement, evolved by the leadership of the movement and refined by Mahatma Gandhi, a strategy evolved in response to the specific nature of the British colonial state, which he termed as semi-authoritarian and semi-democratic. If British rule rested substantially on consent, or at least on acquiescence of Indians and not on force alone? Could it be dislodged also by withdrawing? It could be dislodged also by withdrawing that consent and not by mobilizing force. Use of violence by the movement would only give the British an excuse to launch repression, he said. The battleground was that of ideas, of moral leg legitimacy, and if enough Indians wanted freedom and demonstrated their desire through mass nonviolent action, the British would have to leave. Gandhian methods in Bipin Chandra's hands acquired the status of a revolutionary strategy. Nonviolence became its fulcrum, and the national movement became the Indian Revolution. As Mohit Sen, 
the communist leader, said on behalf of the Indian left, Bipin Chandra gave us back our freedom struggle. It seemed then that the task of recovering the revolutionary Gandhi had taken a great leap forward. However, I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who may imagine that given his widely recognized role in bringing Indian women into mass political action, you might imagine that Gandhi is immune to attack from that flank. The indisputable fact that he did more than any other man or woman to enable women to come out of the home and the kitchen and become political beings. In the civil disobedience movement in 1930, for example, which marked the entry of women in their thousands into political space, he reserved certain important programs, such as boycott of liquor and foreign cloth, exclusively for women. Women participated in salt marches, in salt raids, in picketing. They courted arrest and they went to jail. Indian women did not have to fight a separate <coughs> suffragette movement. They got the vote along with men as part of the universal adult suffrage in the Indian constitution. And for a long time, the Congress was reluctant to allow women to hold any position of authority within the organization. It was keen only on their symbolic presence, unquote. This, when Annie Besant was Congress president in 1917, and Sarojini Naidu in 1925, and any number of women occupied important positions in the Congress organization over the years. Gandhiji further ensured that Indians were trained to struggle against the system and not against individuals, however obnoxious. And I want to emphasize this. And not against individuals, however obnoxious, who ran the system by continually making a distinction between the two. The notion of seeking to punish individuals was entirely missing in the Gandhian framework. The massacre at Jallianwala Bagh was not to be avenged by demanding that the perpetrator, General Dyer, should be hung from the nearest lamppost, but by launching the non-cooperation movement and declaring Swaraj to be the goal. In the Quit India movement, British soldiers were surprised when young nationalist activists rushed to provide first aid to one of their group, hit by a stone from a bystander. Thus, anger was directed against symbols of enslavement, such as foreign cloth, which was boycotted and burnt in huge bonfires, against the salt law or the Chokidar attacks, or the land revenue system, as in Bardoli, and not against colonial officials. Any movement claiming any affinity to the freedom struggle has to imbibe at least this basic idea. Great movements are about bringing about systemic or structural change and not about punishing the guilty. The critique of corruption as it was happening in this movement in an ideological vacuum is also at the risk of being appropriated by forces representing ideologies which are anything but progressive. Fascists, communalists, fundamentalists, populists, and other unidentified objects can all climb on to the idealist, ideology-free bandwagon for a free right to power, because there is no ideological filter which sifts the grain from the chaff. Gandhiji himself had expressed reservations about its use in a democratic framework in independent India. And it cannot be denied that its coercive nature needs to be examined, especially when other avenues of democratic expression are available. Who can deny that its indiscriminate use by all and sundry has robbed it of the moral power it had acquired in the days of the freedom struggle? Another vital difference is the attitude to politics, the political process, and politicians. The national movement sought to bring the whole of civil society into politics. And the best were asked to and did join politics. Gandhiji's great contribution was to make political beings out of India's apathetic dumb millions, his phrase, not mine, not to tell them to shun politics. While critiquing its weaknesses, Gandhiji made it clear 
that the Congress stood for a parliamentary form of government with full civil liberties. The disdain for the political class and the political processes of representative democracy witnessed in the movement that I've been discussing is most dangerous because it fuels cynicism and delegitimizes the democratic system, thus giving strength to authoritarian, fascist, and militaristic alternatives, particularly with reference to the way Gandhiji allegedly harmed the interests of the scheduled castes by preventing the grant of separate electorates in 1932 by going on his famous Pune, the fast in Pune, which ended in the Pune Pact, which showed clearly how Gandhiji's views on caste underwent major transformation over the years, and how it is false to say that he continued to support the caste system in any form. Rajmohan Gandhi points out numerous instances of Gandhiji's refusal to countenance untouchability in any form in his own life, including in his ashrams right from his days in South Africa. Rajmohan also takes issue with her over the critique of Gandhi's racist attitudes in South Africa, a charge recently leveled by another study emanating from South Africa. He argues quite persuasively that it was unhistorical to expect Gandhiji to become a champion of black or African rights even before they had themselves taken up the issue, and how the later African leadership did not see Gandhi in that light, but instead as an inspiration. I would like to add that apart from Gandhiji's views expressed in various forms, we also need to look at his work. Which other leader of the freedom struggle or any revolutionary struggle sent, spent almost two years exclusively of his active political life, as Gandhiji did, in the campaign against caste oppression from 1932 to 1934, going from village to village, by train, by car, by boat and bullock cart, and on foot, into the most interior villages, sitting in temple courtyards, in village assembly halls, arguing with the pundits, the orthodox, the upper castes, against untouchability and caste oppression, and for opening up temples and wells and tanks to the lower castes. My quarrel with those who argue a Gandhi versus Ambedkar binary is, one, that they are doing injustice to history. Antagonisms are exaggerated and accommodations ignored. Ambedkar himself accepted the Congress invitation, extended largely at Gandhiji's behest, to take a seat in the Constituent Assembly and then chair the drafting committee of the Constitution, as well as become the law minister in Nehru's cabinet. Two, and even more importantly, I believe strongly that the younger generation, including and especially youth from Dalit social origins, should have the opportunity, without their minds being closed and biased in advance, of engaging with the work of both Ambedkar and Gandhi, since these were the two most important leaders in modern times who worked in their own ways to grapple with the issue of caste oppression. Gokhale, the early nationalist leader whom Gandhiji called his political guru, hailed him as being, I quote, without doubt made of the stuff of which heroes and martyrs are made." Unquote. More importantly, however, Gokhale said, and I quote, he has in him the marvelous spiritual power to turn ordinary men around him into heroes and martyrs. It was his success in devising the method which he called Satyagraha, of turning ordinary people into heroes and martyrs that gave him the ability to influence decisively the history of India and indeed of the world. Satyagraha, or truth force, for Gandhiji, was not an abstract philosophical, philosophical concept, but a weapon forged in the flame of struggle and sharpened on the whetstone of hard political practice. The word literally means to insist on the truth or stick to the truth. 
The heart and soul of Satyagraha is resistance. Resistance against injustice, against discrimination, against oppression. Resistance to any form of wrongdoing or unfreedom, be it racism, colonialism, communalism, caste oppression, patriarchy, denial of democracy, inequity, or economic deprivation. It encompasses a vast array of forms of struggle bounded only by the limits set by nonviolence. Gandhiji chose Satyagraha at least partly because he did not like the quietest sound of the word passive in passive resistance. He also wanted to posit the notion of adherence to the truth rather than to the law. Gandhiji's notion of Satyagraha embodied, embodies a complex strategy of militant struggle of which nonviolence was one part. It involves a deep understanding of the nature of the modern state, of the capacity of the people to struggle, of the appropriateness of different forms of struggle at different points of time, of when to launch and when to withdraw a struggle. Satyagraha ranges from non-cooperation to civil disobedience, from spinning of yarn to boycott and burning of foreign cloth, from boycott of courts to non-payment of taxes, from selling banned literature to making prohibited salt, from going on a hartal to going on a fast unto death. A nonviolent movement could only be successful if it had mass participation. And mass participation could only be secured if the movement was nonviolent. In Bipin Chandra's words, nonviolence is also a way of becoming equal in political resources to an armed state. Also, if the movement was to be a mass movement involving the millions, including the poor, and not a guerrilla movement or a movement led by a revolutionary army, then nonviolence would be the suitable form. To a crowd who came to the Sabarmati Ashram on the 10th of March, a day before the beginning of the Dandi March in 1930, Gandhiji himself explained how nonviolence enabled the widest participation of the masses and put the government in an unenviable quandary. I quote from Gandhiji. Though the battle is about to begin in a couple of days, how is it that you can come here so fearlessly? I do not think any one of you would be here if you had to face rifle shots or bombs. But you have no fear of rifle shots or bombs. Why? Supposing I had announced that I was going to launch a violent campaign, not necessarily with men armed with rifles, but even with sticks or stones, do you think the government would have left me free until now? Can you show me an example in history, be it in England, America, or Russia, where the state has tolerated violent defiance of authority for a single day? But here you know that the government is puzzled and perplexed. Keywords. His whole strategy was about keeping the government always puzzled and perplexed. Gandhiji demonstrated in movement after movement how non-violent satyagraha worked by placing the government in a no-win situation. It immobilized the government by locking it in an irresolvable dilemma. If it did not suppress a movement that brazenly defied its laws, then its administrative authority would be seen to be undermined and its control would be shown to be weak. But if it suppressed it, it would be seen as a brutal anti-people administration that used violence against non-violent agitators. In either case, it was the government that suffered a blow to its prestige and the movement which witnessed a swelling of its ranks. A British civil servant, C. F. V. Williams, based in Madras, expressed this dilemma in early 1930 in the following short and pithy sentence. I quote, if we do too much, Congress will cry repression. If we do too little, Congress will cry Victory. Jawaharlal Nehru, in his famous presidential address to the Lahore Congress 
1929, which declared complete independence to be the goal of the Congress, expressed the deep connection between nonviolence and mass participation thus. I quote, any great movement for liberation today must necessarily be a mass movement. And mass movements must, must essentially be peaceful, except in times of organized revolt. And if the principal movement is a peaceful one, contemporaneous attempts at sporadic violence can only distract attention and weaken it. Satyagre was no magic wand. It was based on intense preparation and mobilization and extensive mass contact programs. Gandhiji himself toured the length and breadth of the country incessantly in his third class railway carriage, as well as by car, by bullock cart, and on foot. Other leaders followed in his footsteps. Also, in the Gandhian method, empowerment was achieved through inculcating fearlessness in the people. Nonviolence was not uh, the weapon of the weak, it was the weapon of the brave. Jawaharlal Nehru, in the discovery of India, talks thus about Gandhiji's message of fearlessness. I quote, the essence of Gandhiji's teaching was fearlessness, not merely bodily courage, but the absence of fear from the mind. But the dominant impulse in India under British rule was that of fear, pervasive, oppressing, strangling fear. It was against this all-pervading fear that Gandhiji's quiet and determined voice was raised, be not afraid. It was this courage of militant nonviolence of Satyagraha that made heroes out of ordinary men and women, what I started out with, enabling them to defy a mighty empire on which the sun never set. The steely resolve of the Akali Jathas at Guru Kabak, accepting without retaliation the blows of steel-tipped police lattice, the unflinching rhythm of band after band of Satyagrahis determined to raid the salt pans at Dharasana, immortalized by Richard Attenborough in Gandhi. Despite being beaten to pulp when the temperature was 112 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade, the daily travails of the Bardoli peasants who lived for months in fields under the open sky to honor their vow of no tax to the government are only some examples of non-violent heroism. Gandhiji's emphasis on non-violence was also linked to his deep conviction that you could not separate the means from the end. In fact, he believed that the means was bound to shape the end. You could not hope to build a humane, caring, inclusive, and free society on the shaky foundation of violence. The gun that is aimed at the enemy can easily be turned to cow down a comrade with whom you now disagree. If walls were not to come up between peoples, the methods chosen for resolving differences and conflict must be such that they ensure justice without breaking down communication. The Lakshman Rekha of nonviolence made this possible. The answer certainly did not lie in more violence. As Gandhiji said, I quote, hatred can be overcome only by love. Counter-hatred only increases the surface as well as the depth of hatred. Another important form of satyagraha that Gandhiji evolved was that of going on a fast. He used it with great effect against the British in 1943 when he went on a 21-day fast while in jail at the Aga Khan Palace and showed that non-violent protest was possible even within the confines of prison. In fact, I would say he showed how he had turned his body into an instrument of struggle. When all else was taken away from him, he still had his own body with which to struggle. The news of his fast spread like wildfire across India and the world. And hundreds of thousands of people joined in public protests at a time when draconian laws had suppressed all civil liberties in the name of the Second World War. 
The farce succeeded in turning world public opinion against the British government, and even the President of the United States, Roosevelt, put pressure on the British Prime Minister, Churchill, to relent. It is another matter that Gandhiji, as usual, had the last laugh by surviving the 21-day ordeal and denying the British the opportunity of executing the elaborate plans which they had made for his funeral. The files are there in the National Archives. The weapon of the fast was, however, more commonly used by him to exert moral pressure on his own people. As in 1932 at Pune on the issue of separate electorates, or in Rajkot against the princely state in 1938, or in Calcutta and Delhi in 1947 and 1948, to quell the communal riots. We all know those examples. The weapon of the fast was based on the essential principle of Satyagraha, which is to exert moral pressure on your opponent by suffering. Fasting is the extreme form of self-suffering. It is the crucifixion of the flesh voluntarily chosen. As Gandhiji said, I quote, non-violent pressure exerted through self-suffering by fasting, touches and strengthens the moral fiber against those against whom it is directed. That is, fasts were directed not only against opponents, but were equally a means of reaching out to his people, was noted by Louis Fisher, the American biographer of Gandhiji. I quote, Gandhiji had a compelling need to communicate with the hearts of men. He had an artist's genius for reaching the heartstrings of the inner man. But how does one communicate with 100 or 200 or 300 million persons, most of whom are illiterate and only 5,000 of whom have radios? Gandhiji's fasts were means of communication. Gandhiji's agony gave vicarious pain to his adorers, who knew they must not kill God's messenger on earth. It was evil to prolong his suffering. It was blessed to save him by being good. A leader of his people, unsupported by any outward authority, a politician whose success rests not upon craft nor the mastery of technical devices, but simply on the convincing power of his personality, a victorious fighter who has always scorned the use of force, a man of wisdom and humility, armed with resolve and inflexible consistency, who has devoted all his strength to the uplifting of his people and the betterment of their lot, a man who has confronted the brutality of Europe with the dignity of the simple human being, and thus at all times risen superior. Generations to come, it may be, will scarce believe that such a one as this, ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this earth. That was Albert Einstein. Thank you.